Hi everyone, my name is Julie McCrary and this video is part three in a series called Science Practices for AP Psychology students. This particular video goes over conducting psychological research and it's going to be a general overview of the scientific process that psychologists use. I will go more in depth into the different types of research practices and methods in the next video. So to begin, let's take a look at the key focuses in this video. By the end, you should be able to answer the following questions. Number one says, what is the scientific approach to psychological research? Number two, what makes a hypothesis falsifiable? Number three, how can operational definitions support replication? Number four, how can sampling make conclusions more generalizable? And number five, what is the purpose of peer review? You will also be able to define the following essential concepts that are listed on this screen. So to start, psychologists use the scientific method to determine whether ideas or assumptions we have about the mind and behavior are true or false. It starts with an idea or a theory, and that develops into a hypothesis which can be tested. Then research, researchers determine the group or the sample that will be studied, and then the research begins. Data is collected, evidence is evaluated, and afterwards the researcher summarizes the findings in a report and that's sent out to experts in that particular area of study for review and feedback. Then to determine the reliability of the findings, the study is then replicated again and again to see if similar results occur. This is a simplified summary of the scientific process. Over the next few minutes, I will go over these steps in more uh, depth with a specific example. So let's start back at the beginning. Let's start with a theory. Suppose you have a basic understanding of the importance of sleep and you've observed in your own life that you feel better and you think more clearly after a full night's sleep rather than after you've stayed up all night. You've also heard about and read about healthy habits, so you believe that sleep is important to your overall well-being. You believe it helps boost your learning and your memory, and these are all a collection of ideas and observations that you've accumulated into your theory about the importance of sleep. So theories are just ideas that are put together a collection of observations about a particular topic. And for example, our theory in this particular situation is that sleep is helpful for learning and memory. So we don't really know how true that is or how false that is unless we're testing it. And so if we would like to prove this theory, we need to develop a testable prediction where we can measure the results. So this is gonna lead us into the scientific process where we can determine what's true about sleep deprivation and memory. So to check my theory, we're going to make a hypothesis. My hypothesis might be when an individual is sleep deprived, then they will remember less from the day before. So this hypothesis is a prediction about the results of my theory. I'm claiming that less sleep will lead to a reduction in memory. So I can test this. I might need to put a little work into how I'm going to measure these variables, but right now this is a testable prediction. It's a hypothesis. Now, before moving on, I want to make something really clear. A good hypothesis is a falsifiable hypothesis. That means that your hypothesis can be tested and could be proven wrong. Of course, it consequently could be proven right, but falsifiability means that a hypothesis could be tested through experimentation and observation and has the potential to be proven false. If a hypothesis is falsifiable, then we know that it has that potential of, of understanding whether it's right or wrong. Um, now, when we're looking at um, hypotheses, it's just very important that we have this element because we know from video part one that we are susceptible to the confirmation bias just as a human tendency. And so it's important that we're setting up a testable prediction that not only could it be proven true, but it could also be proven false. And psychologists like scientists are interested in truth. And so it doesn't hurt their feelings if a psychologist is proven wrong. It just reveals more information about the topic that they're studying. And so it's not good or bad. It's just more knowledge. And so we need to make sure that our hypothesis could be accepted 
or rejected. So before I continue, I want to make clear three important points from this particular section. One, theories are a collection of ideas, observations, and principles. Number two, a hypothesis is a testable prediction. Number three, we tend to want to prove our beliefs correct, so it's important to create a prediction that is truly testable and could potentially be disproven. This is called a, a falsifiable hypothesis. When developing the study, the psychologist will determine and then report their research with precise and measurable operational definitions. An operational definition is a carefully worded statement that explains the details of the processes and procedures of the study or the operations. Um, it also defines the concepts used in the study. So for example, in this particular study about sleep deprivation and memory retention, the psychologist would need to make sure that they're defining what they mean by sleep deprivation in this study. So in this study, maybe the operational definition might be that sleep deprivation is having at least two hours less than a person's normal natural amount of sleep. They would also need to operationally define what they mean about memory retention. So what does that look like in their study? How are you measuring memory retention? And for them, they might operationally define memory retention as being able to recall 20 words from the previous day's lesson. And by using these carefully worded operational definitions, someone else could come in and replicate this study, um, produce it the same way with the same um, definitions of what sleep deprivation is and how to measure memory retention. And they could then hopefully produce similar results that could be compared. This is an essential part of the scientific research process because if a study can't be replicated, then it's difficult to trust that study. A good study can be re replicated, it can be tested again and again so that the results can be compared for reliability. If the results from multiple tests come back similar, they are called reliable. So reliable just means that the scores are consistent or the results are consistent time after time. So these are the key, three key points to remember from this particular section. Operational definitions are carefully worded, detailed explanations of the operations or the procedures of the research study. Number two, Operational definitions allow for the process of replication. And number three, replication of studies can prove the reliability of the results. So if I were to carry out this study on sleep and memory, I would need to determine the population that I want to study. In this case, I want to study how sleep deprivation impacts high school students. So my population would be adolescent high school students. Now, unfortunately, it would be unfeasible to test every single high school student. And so uh, in order to conduct this study, I would need to select a sample. And a sample is just a smaller group that's taken out of the population to be tested in hopes that the conclusions from that sample then can be inferred about the whole population. And if I replicate this study multiple times with multiple different samples, this can help me get more reliable results regarding sleep deprivation and its impacts on memory in high school students. So selecting a sample might seem like a maybe an insignificant task, but it's really crucial when we are looking at creating a study that produces valid results. So when you are evaluating research studies, be sure to check how the researcher selected their sample. It's important that the sample is both random and representative. So a random sample is when every individual in the population has an equal chance of being selected or chosen for the study, and this reduces sampling bias. So in my sleep study, to gather a random sample, I might select 100 students from a list of all of the high school students using a computer-generated uh, program that might select them at random. But if I don't have that computer-generated randomizing program, I might just alphabetize a list of students from a high school and then select every 10th student until I get to 100 participants in order to randomly select them. It's also important that the sample is representative of the population. This means that the sample reflects either the demographics or the characteristics of the population. Um, this might be, in my particular study of sleep deprivation, it might mean that I'm making sure that my sample has a proportion proportionate ages, genders, and maybe even academic performances. That way that that group of students 
uh, proportionately reflects the whole population of high school students. So when I'm selecting those students, I want to make sure that I have a proportionate number of freshmen and sophomores and juniors and seniors that reflect the whole population, balancing genders and academic levels. Hopefully that it then reflects that population. Sometimes studies use what's called convenience sampling, which is when they select participants based on just ease and accessibility and availability um, rather than doing a random representative sample. Um, and in my sleep deprivation study, maybe if I want to do a convenient sample, maybe I just select the students in my, my psychology classes because they're um, accessible, they're easy, they're right there, they're in my classroom. I don't have to go to the work to randomize the whole population of students and then to make sure it accurately reflects the whole population. I'll just test my students. However, this can lead to a sampling bias because it's unlikely that my psychology students are, are proportionately reflective of all of the students in the population. So before accepting results of a study, make sure that you are critically evaluating and considering the sample of the study. So when you're looking at that research study, it's best if a sample is um, representative and random, that way that you can make generalizations about the whole population. So then throughout the study, you're going to collect the data, you're going to then complete your analysis of the data, you're going to evaluate your findings, you'll have to determine whether or not you accept or reject your hypothesis, and you'll write all of that up, all of your results into a report. You will then share that out with people who are experts in the field, and they're going to give you feedback about how you collected your data, how you evaluated your data, they're going to help you see if you completely the process well, if you had any biases, um, they're going to look through it with a careful eye because the experts in the field, they're going to care about um, truthful and founded research. They're going to want to make sure that your findings are valid and in line with other findings. And so they're going to give you feedback and correction as needed to help you determine if you need to make any changes, if you need to go back and adjust anything, if you need to even go back and redo part of your study or um, rewrite some of your analysis. And this will all be done before publication. And as I mentioned earlier, science is in pursuit of facts and truth. And so this peer review process is not to make you feel like bad about your work or good about your work. This is about furthering psychology and furthering science. And so the peer review process is just another checkpoint to make sure that what is published is founded and accurate. So as students of psychology, it's important that you are using peer reviewed studies because you can know they've been looked over by multiple experts in the field. They've been revised, they've been refined, and then they've been approved for publication. So to close out the video, I have four questions for review. I will read the questions, but not the answers. So be sure to pause the video. That way you have enough time to determine the correct response. And then I'll share the answers on the last slide. Question number one says, why is an operational definition necessary when reporting research findings? Question number two says, a testable prediction that drives research is known as Question number three says researchers are interested in finding out if voters are more likely to vote for candidates who have more pleasant facial expressions. The researchers contact every hundredth person on the voter list to ask about candidate facial expressions. Which method are the researchers using in choosing the people they will call? Question number four says Dr. Buzz wanted to understand the impact of stressful life events on irritability. He asked college students to reflect on three major stressors in their lives. And then he asked the students how many times in a week they yelled at other people. Which of the following captures how Dr. Buzz operationally defined irritability? This concludes part three, conducting psychological research. If you would like to check the multiple choice answers, you can find those at the bottom of the screen. You should also take a moment to see if you can explain the key themes of this video and define the following vocabulary words.